five, four. The Subcommittee on Border Security Facilitation and Operations will come to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. Thank you for joining today's hearing to examine the Administration's use of Title 42, its upcoming termination, and the need to restore access to asylum at the border. For two years, Customs and Border Protection has been expelling vulnerable migrants into Mexico and other countries without allowing them access to our asylum system. Vulnerable migrants are fleeing gang violence and persecution in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. Political persecution and violence in Nicaragua and kidnapping and political turmoil in Haiti. Because of Title 42, migrant families and adults have been unable to apply for asylum at ports of entry throughout the pandemic. I'd like to remind the committee that applying for asylum is legal under U.S. and international law. Instead, CBP expelled approximately 1.7 million migrants from the United States and denied vulnerable individuals the opportunity to seek protection. While Title 42 order was supposedly based on a public health rationale, the science was never sound. A former senior official in the Trump administration called it a, quote, Stephen Miller special, end quote. This order was a pretext to close the border to black, brown, and indigenous people. Leading medical experts have consistently argued throughout Title 42's use that there has never been a solid public health justification for closing our border just to asylum seekers. Even if this poly policy had been based on public health, we must recognize that we've come a long way since March of 2020 when this policy was first implemented. With vaccines, masks, and other effective public health strategies now widely available, the U.S. can safely manage infections and the spread of the virus. There is no justification for denying vulnerable migrants the legal right to seek asylum. There is no justification for singling out migrants as a COVID risk. Republicans stoke fear about migrants bringing COVID-19 into communities, yet they have fought to lift indoor mask mandates since the beginning of the pandemic. Republicans say there's no safe way to allow migrants to travel throughout, into and throughout the United States, yet they sue the federal government to lift the mask mandate on public transportation. We know masks and vaccines work. There is no evidence that denying people access to our asylum system prevents COVID. However, we do know that Title 42 is harming migrants including those who are most vulnerable. In fact, one of our witnesses here today has helped document nearly 10,000 instances of people being kidnapped, tortured, sexually assaulted, and murdered after being expelled under Title 42. Title 42 has also resulted in family separations. Parents who traveled at the border with their children have been denied the opportunity to request asylum. They are presented with two options. They can wait for an indeterminate amount of time in dangerous border towns where, there are vulnerable, where they are vulnerable to kidnapping and violence, or they can send their children to the border alone to seek refuge. No family should have to make this choice. I'd also like to point out that CBP is not uniformly applying Title 42. For example, we've recently seen migrants from Europe exempted from this horrible policy, while black and brown migrants are quickly turned away. To be clear, Ukrainians should be allowed to enter the United States and seek us humanitarian protection. But so should Haitians and Hondurans and Guatemalans, Africans and others fleeing violence. The U.S. government has the capacity to allow any migrant, no matter which part of the world they are fleeing, the opportunity to request asylum. The department has a plan for increasing its processing capacity and ending Title 42 and I am willing to work with them to make sure they are prepared to process people in an orderly and humane manner. We must also recognize that Title 42 did not stop migration to the United States. Although our nation's doors were shut to asylum seekers for two years, migrants have been coming to our borders in large numbers. Conditions were so dangerous at home that they could not wait. Given the number of people already at our doorstep just waiting for a chance to ask for help, it is not surprising that the administration expects encounters to increase after Title 42 is lifted. But this is America, and our government has the tools to safely process 
and screen people at the border as required by law to determine whether they qualify for asylum or other humanitarian protections. With the proper planning, this is an opportunity for the administration to uphold its promise of creating a just and orderly process at the border. The department has set up Southwest Border Coordination Center to coordinate planning and operations across the interagency. It is working to get the personnel and resources in place to not only process migrants in a safe and humane manner, but also to provide migrants with vaccines. I'm just disappointed that the department still needs more time to prepare to end Title 42. They've already had it for two years. And they've had two years to plan to end it. As the department deploys resources and personnel at the border, the administration must also proactively coordinate with non-government organizations and border communities in winding down the Title 42 order. I look forward to hearing recommendations from our witnesses on specific actions the administration should consider in order to restore the asylum process in a humane manner, as well as on the harms caused by F Title 42. And I want to remind everybody, Title 42 is a CDC authority. It's an authority, a public health authority, to stop the spread of COVID-19. It is not an immigration law or a policy. It's a public health authority. With now the chair, would like to recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, subcommittee, Mr. Higgins of Louisiana, for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank our witnesses for being here with us today and for our panelists that's, uh, that's going to be joining us virtually. It, it, Title 42 is, is a legal mechanism that Border Patrol uses, that our law enforcement professionals use to try and stem the tide of millions of illegal immigrants crossing our southern border. We're losing our country down there. In the summer of 2020, the, the, the criminal cartels were incredibly well-funded, very well-organized. They have, they have deep counsel within their networks, within their chain of command, a lot of whom have been educated in America. They know American laws and American politics. These cartels run a vast well-organized network that traffics human beings and drugs into America. Why are they coming to America? Because it's a big market for them. It's their business model, and they're very good at it. And in the, by the summer of 2020, when it began to be part of the narrative that there was a chance that then-candidate Biden might win the presidential election, the cartels used their networks to begin prepping they got ready. They beefed up their infrastructure based on my data on the ground through Central America and Mexico, through to, to all the way through Venezuela and Colombia, where the, the pipeline and the Western Hemisphere begins. I was advised that, that we can anticipate as many as 2 million illegal crossings in 2021. It never happened before. I talked about those numbers. It turned out I was off a little bit. I was low. We had 2.4 million illegal crossings in 2021. Their pipelines were filled. They were not interrupted by a hurricane or earthquake, which was a possibility, but didn't happen. And they ramped up their, their capacities in the summer. There's nothing was stopping them. It's the equivalent to having a passenger in every seat. The cartels were making billions and sending untold amounts of incredibly deadly drugs into our country. They had 2.4 million illegal crossings, including 500,000 that were, that were young men plugged into the criminal networks in Mexico and Central America, hooked up through, the, through the, their cartel connections to cross a lot of them owing their crossing money in the form of criminal services by delivering uh, sex, slave labor, prisoners, and, and, and tragic souls who had fallen into that trap and by carrying drugs, a backpack at a time, into our country. Where did those guys go? They went deep into America, to a neighborhood near you. They all want to come here and be successful in their job, and their job is to be part of the criminal network. Maybe they didn't get out of that trap, but it's very hard. 
You know, once someone goes down that path, it's very difficult for a young man that's involved in, 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 in criminal networking, wherever he is, it's very hard to get out. So they've crossed into our country and they've been dispersed across America now. This is why your, your, your border communities might not show this as part of the business model. And boy, if you work for the cartel, you better not mess with the cartel's business model, which requires passage across our southern border for human trafficking and drug trafficking. They have the category of human beings that cross over and want to interact with professional law enforcement. They turn themselves in. They're largely not violent, good people looking for a better life. We, we prefer that they come in legally and, and, and access our country through legal means other than abuse of the asylum system, which those laws should be strengthened. But there's the other category of the, the young men that avoid contact with law enforcement at the border. They're coming here for no good. And, and Title 42 has allowed us to stem the tide. If we take Title 42 away, it, our country cannot sustain. We, we're headed for 3 million this year. People looked at me like I was crazy at the beginning of last year when I said 2 million. But my sources were right. And the, the, America cannot support it, regardless of how peaceful you find communities here and there, son. Our nation cannot sustain this. Uh, I will say to my colleagues across the aisle in good faith, if you have a problem with Title 42, by all means, use your, your constitutional access to, to our judicial system, challenge it in court and defeat it. If you think it's wrong and illegal, unconstitutional, by all means, defeat it judicially. Right now, it's a legal tool that's needed on the border. And if we take it away, I'm afraid that the demise of our nation will uh, accelerate. What we're witnessing right now will, will become worse and worse and worse. Madam Chair, I yield. Oh, thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. You mentioned two million. I think Poland has uh, welcomed two million Ukrainians, um, and they're the small size of New Mexico. So, I appreciate, it, Madam Chair. I don't, I don't work for Poland. I work for the citizens of America. But thank you. Okay. Well, I was just trying to put into perspective the the numbers that that you gave. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Um, I want to thank you for your opening remarks. Members are reminded that the subcommittee will operate according to the guidelines laid out by the chairman and the ranking member in their February 3rd colloquy. Without objection, members who do not sit on the committee may participate in this hearing. Um, the chair would now take the opportunity to recognize uh, the full committee chair, uh, but I do not see him present. Uh, therefore, we will uh, move on. Next, I would recognize uh, the chair of the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Kako, but not seeing him either virtually. Um, Mr. Higgins, I will also move on and take an opportunity now to welcome our panel of witnesses. Uh, we have some of witnesses here in person today and we have a witness also appearing virtually as well. And first in person, um, Mr. Aaron Reichlin Melnick is a senior policy counsel at the American Immigration Council. Mr. Kenji Keizuka is an Associate Director of Research and Analysis for Refugee Protection at Human Rights First. Dr. Adam Richards is Associate Professor at George Washington University School of Medicine and a board member of Physicians for Human Rights. Our last witness is virtually um, Sheriff Mark Daniels is a sheriff in Cochise County, Arizona. Thank you for uh, joining us virtually, sir. Now, with that objection, the witness's full statements will be inserted into the record. I now will ask each witness to summarize his or her statement for five minutes, beginning with Mr. Reichlin Melnick. Chairwoman Baragan, Ranking Member Higgins, and distinguished members of the committee and subcommittee. My name is Aaron Reichlin Melnick, and I am Senior Policy Counsel for the American Immigration Council, a nonprofit organization dedicated to ensuring that the United States provides a fair process for all immigrants. 
I'm here today and grateful for the opportunity to provide some perspective on the effect of Title 42 on border operations and management. I'm here today with one message. Title 42 has failed. Two years and 1.7 million expulsions later, border on encounters are on track to hit record levels once again. As you will hear today, the evidence is clear. Title 42 is neither a meaningful public health measure nor a successful deterrent. One statistic in particular demonstrates this failure. A staggering 94% of Mexican, Guatemalan, Salvadoran, and Honduran single adult migrants apprehended in the last two years have been expelled under Title 42. If Title 42 were a successful deterrent, we would expect such a near total border shutdown to reduce apprehensions at the border of that demographic. But that hasn't happened. Since the start of fiscal year 2021, single adults from those four countries accounted for 1.5 out of 2.5 million total apprehensions. So how can this be? Because Title 42 itself caused a fourfold increase in repeat border crossings. In fiscal year 2019, just 7% of people encountered by CBP had previously crossed the border within the last 12 months. It is now 27% and has been for the last two years. This occurred for two reasons. First, Title 42 almost entirely closed the ports of entry to asylum seekers. Facing desperation and insecurity in northern Mexico, even the most staunchly rule-bound asylum seekers may feel forced to cross the border repeatedly in the hopes of finding safety. And second, Title 42 expulsions to Mexico carry no collateral consequences, meaning that the most likely outcome of a failed border crossing attempt is a quick expulsion back to Mexico where people face violence, insecurity, and the incentive to cross again. Over the last 17 months, at least 820,000 border encounters were repeat encounters of the same person on their second, third, fourth, or even higher attempt. One person even told a reporter that he had been expelled 30 times under Title 42. Not only has this placed additional strain on the border patrol, it has also painted a distorted picture of the true number of people crossing the border. Title 42 has also failed as a border management tool because for logistical and diplomatic reasons, it cannot be applied uniformly to all nationalities. Once a person is on US soil, they can only be expelled to a country which will take them, and Title 42 relies almost exclusively on Mexico as that destination. But when it agreed to Title 42, the government of Mexico placed significant limitations on the groups which could be expelled there. And if someone cannot be expelled to Mexico, it's unlikely that they can be expelled at all. ICE does not have the capacity to carry out mass expulsions via air, and some countries place their own limitations on repatriation, like Cuba. These reasons, among others, are why Title 42 has failed as a border management policy. As DHS prepares to lift Title 42 on May 23rd, its short-term goal should be to simultaneously recreate an actual asylum process at the ports of entry, ensure that those who cross irregularly are not held in constitutionally inadequate conditions, and free up Border Patrol agents from paperwork that keeps them out of the field. To do this, DHS should surge resources to CBP's Office of Field Operations for processing at the ports of entry, and increase resources within the border. Five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Barragan, Ranking Member Higgins, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for holding this timely hearing on the Title 42 policy and for the opportunity to testify. For over 40 years, Human Rights First has pressed the United States to take a leading role in upholding human rights. Today, my colleagues are supporting Ukrainian human rights defenders documenting atrocities, working with partners around the globe to advocate for targeted sanctions against human rights abusers, and providing pro bono legal representation in the United States to refugees seeking asylum. We applaud the Biden administration's decision to terminate the Title 42 policy. It is not, and never was, a justifiable public health response to the pandemic, as epidemiologists and medical experts have repeatedly confirmed. Instead, the Title 42 policy has been used to evade US asylum laws and treaty obligations. Asylum seekers have been blocked from requesting protection at ports of entry, and people seeking refuge who are overwhelmingly black, brown, and indigenous, have been expelled to danger without an opportunity to apply for asylum. 
Through field investigations and interviews with asylum seekers, attorneys, and human rights monitors, our refugee protection team has documented the grave human rights violations that have been caused by this illegal policy. We have tracked at least 9,886 reports of kidnapping, torture, rape, and other brutal assaults on people blocked in or expelled to Mexico under Title 42 during the Biden administration. Many have been abducted and attacked by cartels that target asylum seekers expelled to Mexico. A Salvadoran family with eight and 12-year-old children kidnapped almost immediately after being expelled to Mexico in the middle of the night were held captive for 20 days, locked in a storage room by men who repeatedly threatened to rape the mother. A 29-year-old Venezuelan asylum seeker turned away at the Hidalgo port of entry, was abducted, threatened at knife point, and raped. Black asylum seekers stranded in Mexico due to Title 42 faced brutal violence. Mexican police beat an Afro-Honduran man in the head with a tree branch, leaving him blind in one eye. In Tijuana, a man with a baton severely beat a Haitian asylum seeker in front of Mexican police, who did nothing. Title 42 has also inflicted horrific harm on children, blocked from protection and expelled to further danger. A 14-year-old Cuban boy chewed off his fingernails from the stress and anxiety of being expelled with his grandmother to Mexico, where they had been kidnapped and forced to watch as their abductors killed another kidnapping victim. A 13-year-old Honduran girl who had been raped in Mexico was expelled with her asylum-seeking mother back to Mexico, despite threats against them by the attacker. Blocking requests for asylum at ports of entry endangers lives. A young LGBT man fleeing political persecution in Venezuela was turned away at the Laredo port of entry and returned to highly dangerous Nuevo Laredo, where he and an American friend who was trying to help him had been kidnapped the day before. Following the instructions of Border Patrol agents to present herself legally, a Guatemalan woman was raped after attempting to seek protection at the San Isidro port of entry, which she found closed to asylum seekers. Unable to request asylum at ports of entry because of Title 42 and facing grave dangers in Mexico, refugees have been pushed across the border between ports. Recently, DHS has rightly exempted Ukrainian refugees from Title 42, receiving them at ports of entry. We urge DHS to also process asylum seekers from Africa, the Americas, and the Caribbean who remain stranded in danger, unable to seek asylum due to Title 42. The discriminatory, this discriminatory double standard must end. Restarting and ramping up asylum at ports of entry is also crucial to ending the disorder caused by Title 42. In addition, expulsions that return people to persecution or torture in violation of US laws and treaty obligations must end including expulsions to the deteriorating security and political situation in Haiti. The administration should ensure safe reception of people seeking asylum with support and legal information provided through border shelter networks, and should work to establish a fair, timely, and accurate asylum process in communities where asylum seekers will stay. Coordination with and support to NGOs providing assistance should also be strengthened. People fleeing for their lives will continue to arrive at the border to seek asylum, as they have for more than two years with Title 42 in place. Extending Title 42 will only exacerbate disorder and result in yet more grievous attacks against refugees illegally blocked from protection. The United States has capacity to welcome asylum seekers and treat them with dignity. Other countries with far fewer resources host the vast majority of the world's refugees. Individuals, communities, and NGOs around this country stand ready to receive and welcome refugees. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your testimony. I now will recognize Dr. Richards to summarize your statement for five minutes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today to bring the public health and medical perspective regarding the impact of Title 42 expulsions. My name is Adam Richards. And I'm an associate professor of global health and medicine at the George Washington University, and a member of Physicians for Human Rights Board of Directors. So as a physician, a public health professor, researcher, and practitioner, I know that with intimate knowledge, the devastating effects of COVID-19. Last year, I worked in a COVID isolation and quarantine unit at the center of the epidemic in Los Angeles and saw the death and destruction from the novel coronavirus. I personally lost both patients and colleagues to COVID. So even for those who survive, COVID takes a toll on our bodies and on our communities. Here in DC, I work in a COVID recovery clinic and I take care of people with long COVID. They're exhausted, 
but they can't sleep. They have chronic headaches, shortness of breath, and difficulty concentrating. They struggle to work and to take care of their families. I take COVID-19 seriously, and I want us as a country to do what we can to reduce our risk of infection, death, and disability. However, expelling asylum seekers under Title 42 has not done anything to protect us from COVID. While well, PHR welcomes the CDC's recently announced plan to rescind Title 42 order effective May 23rd, the fact remains that public health should never have been invoked to further a political decision to block people from seeking asylum. There is widespread scientific consensus that there is no public health justification for Title 42. As Dr. Fauci stated, COVID-19 transmission, quote, is not driven by immigrants. And quote, expelling migrants is not the solution to an outbreak. A perspective article, last week's New England Journal of Medicine, also applies a scientific lens to Title 42 expulsions as completely lacking in epidemiological evidence and not reflecting public health best practice. The U.S. government can implement border processing safely. I'm part of a national group of physicians and public health experts that has sent a series of letters to both the Trump and to the Biden administrations to repeatedly explain that Title 42 expulsions do not protect public health and to offer instead common sense, evidence-based rights respecting recommendations for the safe processing of people who arrive at the US-Mexico border. We have strategies to drive the risk of COVID-19 to near zero with evidence-based public health tools you know these, mass social distancing, testing, and vaccines, to safely process asylum seekers at the border and ensure the risk to public health in the United States is close to non-existent. However, threats to the health of asylum seekers who are prevented by Title 42 from crossing the border are very real. I heard these accounts firsthand in Tijuana, Mexico, from asylum seekers who courageously described how they were extorted for money and exposed to physical and sexual violence. They shared how conditions on the border took a tremendous toll on their physical and mental health. For additional stories on the border, I suggest you read the report from July 2021 by a team of PHR researchers who visited Tijuana and Ciudad Juarez to document the health and human rights consequences of Title 42. But if you aren't moved by stories and prefer quantitative studies with numbers, then I, it's worth highlighting again the work that uh, Kenji Kazuka uh, and his colleagues at Human Rights First have done that tracked more than, oh, let's see, 10, 20, 30, 9,866 reports of kidnappings and other violent attacks against migrants and asylum seekers blocked in Mexico or expelled to Mexico since Biden took office. That's nearly 10,000 violent attacks that could have been prevented by ending Title 42. You may be familiar with the historical legacy of using public health as a pretext to justify racist and xenophobic U.S. immigration policies. In the past, it was typhus, trachoma, and HIV, though the ever-shifting medical labels misused to exclude immigrants also went beyond so-called contagions to include mental health disorders, chronic disability, or even a poor physique. Today, the medical excuse misused to exclude is COVID. These exclusionary practices are not now and were not ever based on sound public health principles. We in medicine and public health often pretend that we are immune from the pernicious plagues of racism, xenophobia, and hate. Tragically, these pathologies continue to propagate within our ranks. Not anymore, not in our name. Tools exist to calibrate mitigation procedures to safely process migrants in response to local COVID conditions. There is no public health justification for Title 42. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Richards, for your testimony. I now will recognize our next witness, who's virtual, Sheriff Dunnels, to summarize your statement for five minutes. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Nanette Bergan, and Ranking Member Clay Higgins, and distinguished members of this subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to address this committee regarding the status of our southern border from the aspect of a community slash law enforcement perspective. I have served our border communities for 38 years, and prior to that as a member of our military serving in the U.S. Army stationed here on Fort Huachuca within Cochise County. I've always been a genuine believer in the oath of office to protect our country and now my county as a duly elected sheriff for the last nine years. I'm the current president of the Arizona Sheriff Association, chair of the National Sheriff Association Border Security 
on the executive board for Western State Sheriffs and an active member of Southwest Board of Sheriffs. All these associate, excuse me, all the associations share four objectives: public safety, national security, humanitarian, and now health due to the pandemic. In my submitted brief, I've shared with you an overview of Cochise County and the history of our border. I have personally experienced the good, the bad, the ugly of being a border county. My office has also addressed border-related crimes, smuggling of both illicit drugs, humans, weapons, and cash by our transnational organizations, i.e. criminal cartels. I am proud of our relationship with our law enforcement partners that serve our communities. To begin, I want to thank our Customs and Border Patrol officers and agents who have worked tirelessly and diligently, diligently to protect this great nation. I want to thank our governor, Doug Ducey, and our state congressional members for all their support. The, the men and women of the Cochise County Sheriff's Office for their dedication and commitment to keeping our community safe. And to my fellow sheriffs that stand united for the rule of law in the protection of their communities. And finally, I want to thank my citizens for their patience and support in a time of crisis and disarray here at our borders. To best understand my presentation is to understand where we were, we were approximately 18 months ago. My county was one of the safest counties along the southwest border based on our collective efforts, messaging, and yes, enforcement uh, efforts supported by legal consequences. We maintain a 100% conviction rate on any drug smuggler within Cochise County. Our border-related encounters were a manageable 400 per month. Yesterday, I got the stats of over 7,000. Border-related crimes were minimal at best, and most important, our citizens felt safe with their quality of life being promoted within their home and family. Currently over the last year, the Southern border experienced 379% increase of encounters, 1.7 million, representing over 160 countries, 180,000 pounds of meth, 10,000 pounds of fentanyl, 86,000 pounds of cocaine, 60 homicide suspects, 488 sexual assault suspects, and 336 weapon violations. And sadly, just in Arizona, over 160 migrant deaths in our Southern Arizona. In February of 2022, there was 163,539 encounters with 151,869 being released in our country. Only a little over 11,000 were returned. Additionally, there was 50, 53,464 gotaways and 67 deaths, deaths just in the month of February. In my area, we had 22,289 encounters with 21,290 being released and only 995 returned with seven deaths and 16,000 migrants, uh, excuse me, got, got a waste. What's the direct impact on my county? Uh, we've seen infrastructure shut down down here. Mainly what we deal with is uh, the got a ways. We receive between 900 to 1,000 uh, smugglers come to my county at $1,000 per person to drive them three hours to Phoenix, Arizona, Maricopa County. Uh, that has created a huge impact between July 1 of 2021 and February 2022. 1.1 million dollars just in border related crimes being booked into my local jail a couple personal stories a citizen of my county driving to her 65th birthday was struck by a 16 year old smuggler who had three undocumented individuals in the vehicle drove through a red light at 100 miles an hour and cut her in, cut the car in half and killed her instantly um her son drove up in this scene moments later a home invasion where you did broke into an elderly couple's home they uh, ransacked the home while the couples barricaded themselves in the bedroom. I will say this, my fellow sheriffs and I tried to partner with this administration to include the President of the United States with high hopes to share a collective message, collective action plan, support the rule of law, prioritize our southern border and provide updates, reference, community impacts and concerns with little to no success. By allowing our border security mission and immigration laws to be discretionary, these criminal cartels continue to be the true winners. They exploit, uh, they exploit mankind, uh, the exploitation of mankind is simply modern day slavery, allowing thousands of pounds of illicit drugs in our country to continue to erode the core values of uh, our families. Our voice of reason has been buried during what I call the intellectual avoidance by this administration. And yes, members of U.S. Congress, communities have neglected and abandoned relying on our own local and state resources to address border uh, security that's in a crisis. Uh, I'll close out with my five minutes. I'll say this once again, I thank the subcommittee for the invite and opportunity and now stand ready to answer any questions by members. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sheriff Daniels for, um, Daniels for your testimony. Um, I wanna thank all of our witnesses for their testimony. I will remind the subcommittee that we will each have five minutes to question the panel. And I will start with myself and recognize myself for five minutes. 
My first question is for you, Mr. Kizuka. The Biden administration has committed to ensuring orderly processing at the U.S. southern border. How would reopening ports of entry help the administration achieve this goal? Thank you, Representative Barragan. Opening ports of entry along the southern border is a crucial um, step that the Biden administration should take immediately to ensure that asylum seekers can present themselves safely and in an orderly manner and that their claims are processed under U.S. law um, that Congress adopted. Uh, from two years now, those laws have been ignored and asylum seekers have been turned away to danger, creating additional disorder, creating unnecessary suffering of people who return back to danger. Thank you. We, um, we've been hearing about the alleged, you know, the, the cartel information, and we can all agree that cartels should be shut down. Um, and I think that one of the things by opening our ports of entry is you're going to have people coming to the ports of entry as opposed to feeling like they have to go to a smuggler. Um, my next question for you is uh, Mr. Raiklin Melnick. In your testimony, you state that Title 42 and increased migration has no impact on the flow of opioids into the United States. My Republican colleagues like to claim otherwise. Can you explain the data that supports your statement? Thank you, Rep Barragan. As former CBP Commissioner um, Gil Karlikowski said recently, the drugs that are actually taking the lives of people here in the United States, methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, and fentanyl, almost universally come through the ports of entry along the southern border. And indeed, if you look at the CBP's own data, 95% of all opioids that were seized at the southern border in the last two years, uh, sorry, in the last two and a half years, were seized at the ports of entry or were seized at Border Patrol checkpoints in vehicles. That is because, as the DEA itself says, quote, land transportation via the interstate system is the most predominant method of transporting illicit opioids. Smugglers know that they can get drugs in through the ports of entry because, as CBP's uh, Diane Sabatino testified in the Senate in November, just 15% of commercial vehicles are screened for narcotics at ports of entry, and only 2% of passenger vehicles are screened for narcotics. So um, just to follow up on that, what tools are effective in preventing the flow of opioids into the United States? As CBP has said for years, investments in technology at the ports of entry are the number one thing that will help reduce the flow of opioids into the, opioids into the United States. The cartels are smart, and they know that where they can get the drugs into the country is in tractor trailers, in parcels, in packages, and through the mail. There, are, there is very little fentanyl coming across the border on the backs of migrants in backpacks. Nearly all of it comes in through the ports of entry. Thank you. Dr. Richards, my last two minutes is for you. As our understanding of COVID-19 has evolved and improved, so have the measures society can take to beat back the spread of the virus. I have two questions. What preventive measures can the administration use to mitigate the risk of COVID-19 infections, infections at the border and two, if these preventive measures are taken, do you believe migrants would pose a public health threat to border communities or the nation? Thank you, Chairman Wynne Barragan, uh, for, those, for those two questions. So I, I think everybody by this point probably knows the answer to what we can do because it's the same things that we've been using uh, in, this, in this country and it's masking and social distancing. One of the more effective things in this setting would be to minimize the time that people spend in congregate settings. So detention is never a good idea, um, but limiting the amount of time that people have to spend in those congregate settings like detention centers, CVP facilities uh, would be great. But if you have to um, you know, keep people in those, in those facilities, we can definitely also keep them safe. Masking is highly, highly effective. You know, I have worked for months in this isolation center. People were coughing virus all around me. I, I still, to this day, I don't think have you know, gotten, uh, gotten COVID. Uh, it's also worth noting that around the world, vaccination rates have been going up. So people who present to our borders are more likely to be vaccinated. It's now over half kind of, of adults. Uh, from most of the countries that folks uh, come from now, and encouraging vaccination is probably the single most important tool that, uh, that we would have. And so it's great to see that there's progress being made there. Um, there is, there would not be a risk. I mean, there are over 50,000, um, you know, there's tens of thousands of cases that are transmitted internally in the U.S., and the number that would um, potentially 
um, sneak through would be infinitesimally small and not contribute in any meaningful way to transmission here. So there's no risk to communities. Thanks. Uh, well, thank you for that. And uh, we know that migrants that are coming out under other programs like Remain in Mexico, the U.S. is actually vaccinating them as they come in. So there's opportunities to vaccinate migrants as they um, as they come in. So now I uh, would like to recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Higgins, for your five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Melnick, Mr. Kazook, and Dr. Rich Richards, I'm going to ask you, gentlemen, a couple of yes or no questions. It's not a trap. Just to set up my further question, and sort of to all of you. Dr. Richards, before I get started, thank you for working uh, with the homeless, sir, in the streets of Los Angeles. My understanding is you're, you're part of that effort. Um, so as a compassionate child of God, I thank you for that work that you do. So Mr. Melnick, Kazuka, Dr. Richards, are, are you each an American citizen? Sir, yes? Yes. Yes? Yes? Yes. yes? Okay. And do each of you believe that your, your position on Title 42 is, is, is righteous, that you have eloquently stated, each of you? Do you believe you're righteous and solid in your position? Mr. Melnick? I believe the facts and the data support the conclusion. Yeah, that's this. It's, it's a, you may be a congressman one day, sir, up here. If you're solid in your position, may I say, you could say, yes, I'm solid in my position. Mr. Kazuka? Our opposition to Title 42 comes from our belief. I'm not asking what it came from. Just you feel solid. U.S. law and treaty obligations. So you feel it's a righteous position that you've, that you've presented. It is the lawful position. Okay, I'm glad you said that. One would hope that your lawful position and your determination is also based upon what you feel is right. That's what righteous means. Dr. Richards? Uh, my st statement reflects uh, scientific evidence and medical and public health science. So you, Thank you. So you feel solid about it? It's a right position, a righteous position. You I don't know why you we're avoiding the word words, righteous, but I, I, I shall stand not. by my statement. Thank so, you. So let me ask, uh, you gentlemen, and your nonprofits, have any of your nonprofits associated yourself or signed on a lawsuits against Title 42 in federal court? The answer is no. For you, Mr. Melnick, your organization has not. Mr. Kazuka? Yes, we have joined Amicus Have Briefs. you joined ACLU? We have, we have joined amicus briefs in opposition to Title 42. That is correct. Okay, it, that's, that's excellent. And you were the young man that said that your position was lawful. Dr. Richards, as your nonprofit, what's it called, uh, CPI? Is it join a lawsuit? I'm here with Physicians for Human Rights. Community Partners International is another organization I've been affiliated with. I'm no longer on the board of directors. Well, according of that organization. to your background, I was just reading your background, so there's nothing to be ashamed mm -hmm. of. That it's, it, uh, are you aware of it? Are you associated with any lawsuit against Title 42? Personally, I'm, I'm unaware. Okay, of well, human let me just say, gentlemen, that you could be. You could be. If you feel passionately about your position, you're an American citizen, by all means. Pursue your rights under the Constitution to seek legal remedy. But right now, Title 42 is legal. Sheriff, are you there, my brother? Yes, ranking member. Sheriff, tell us what's going to happen on May the 23rd in your, in your community if Title 42 is lifted. Uh, we have great concern. Uh, let me say that the Border Patrol agents, customs to include local law enforcement communities are very concerned because we have failed to recognize border security throughout the last 18 months, which has been a huge impact on my community, along with my sheriffs that I work with on the southwest border. Effective um, May 23rd, when Title 42 goes away, this will compound our issues already in a community that addresses public safety, national security, and humanitarian with the deaths that we're seeing on our borders. So until we get a manageable, reasonable policy and direction on our southern border, this will continue to get worse. It's, it's pretty slow. bad, it's isn't it, Sheriff? In the interest of time, I only have 45 seconds remaining. My thin blue line, brother. How, how long have you been wearing a badge, Sheriff? 38 years. In 38 years, have you ever seen anything like what we're facing right now? 
this is the worst I've ever seen it. And you and you're sworn to protect and serve the citizens of your community, are you not? Yes, I am. Your men, your women that still serve, that wear your badge, your dedicated, compassionate law enforcement professionals, sir? Yes. Well, some of us stand with them. God bless you. Thank you. Sheriff, I'm at your avail. Um, Madam Chair, I yield. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Ranking Member. Some of us down with law enforcement too, and we did help fund to make sure they had dollars um, under the American Rescue Plan. The chair will now recognize other members for questions they may wish to ask the witnesses. As previously outlined, I will recognize members in order of seniority, alternating between majority and minority. Members are reminded to unmute themselves when recognized for questions. The chair recognizes for five minutes the gentleman from California, Mr. Correa, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses as well for being here today. Um, this is an important hearing, not just because it's about Title 42, but it touches about a very important issue, which is refugees to our nation, not just at the border, to our nation. The historical context of how America has been open to refugees and what constitutes a refugee or not. And the four witnesses, I believe, have talked more or less of some of the facts that we have in front of us. But to me, bottom line is, 42 has been used inconsistently to address a bigger issue, which is the refugee challenge. I'm very proud that the Biden administration just waived 42 and gave temporary protective status to the Ukrainian refugees. A week and a half ago, I was at the uh, Tijuana border, got off a plane at the airport, had Ukrainian refugees welcoming other Ukrainian refugees to Tijuana, getting ready to bring them over, process them, so to speak, help them in the process to the U.S. Just spoke to another Ukrainian activist who told me that in Mexico, Tijuana, Mexico, they are right now, Mexican government setting up a soccer stadium to take in all of the Ukrainian refugees because they are essentially overwhelmed by the numbers. And this is before the Russian refugees hit Tijuana, Mexico. We're looking at a very interesting and challenging situation and the question we have to ask ourselves as Americans is, are we open to refugees or not? And, and, our, and Mr. Ranking Member, your witness very correctly stated the ill effects of having cartels in the middle of the smuggling business. Eight to $10,000 per person is what these folks pay to get to the Mexican border, the US-Mexico border. I got a figure, you sell everything you own, your soul into human slavery to get to the US border. Then you have very ugly outcomes. And I ask myself, we can debate the facts. But let's talk about solutions, folks. I'm gonna ask the witnesses, how practical would it be to set up a system where you can apply for refugee status in your home country? $10,000 you pay to get to the border. I was talking to a Central American ambassador that told me 80% of the ladies, the women, by the time they get to the U.S.-Mexico border are either raped or sexually assaulted. A horrible situation. And I would like us to reach across the aisle here, not talk about, you know, the negativity, but talk about the challenge, the problem in front of us. How can we get legitimate refugees to apply for refugee status in a safe manner that doesn't cost them $10,000. They don't have to expose themselves to a thousand, thousand mile trip and be in harm's way. Can we legitimately fund, can we fund refugee application processes in their home countries and have legitimate outcomes in a timely manner? I have like a minute left, but if any of the witnesses would care to answer that question, is that something we can do? I got 55 seconds. Come on, folks, come on. I, 
Thank you, Representative Correa. The, the answer is, is that we can support refugee processing in other countries. The correct time to do that would have been years ago. But we also have to recognize that there are some people who can't wait. If the cartels or MS-13 shows up at your home tomorrow and says, if you don't leave, we're gonna kill you and we're gonna take your children, it's nice to know that you could have applied for refugee status, but you might have to leave the next day. All of us who've been to the border have talked to people who never wanted to leave, but they had to make a split second decision because if they didn't, their lives were going to be lost. And, so and I, I, would, I, would, I would say to you that those are factors we can look at because getting to the border and being in the situation that I see right now at the border is also not a safe, acceptable situation. So I hope that I can work with my colleagues across the aisle to figure this one out because, again, right now, thinking about over the last two weeks, you got a, a stadium full of Ukrainian refugees that just popped up on you. You got a couple more coming at you. We got to figure out this problem sooner rather than later. And finally, let me say, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and others are stepping up and saying, we need the workers. There's a win-win here somewhere. Madam Chair, I yield. Uh, thank you, Mr. Correa. Uh, the chair now recognizes for five minutes the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Guest. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. And before I begin, I would ask unanimous consent to submit ranking member Katko's statement for the record. No objection. It's a, thank you. Uh, Sheriff, I want to thank you uh, for joining us uh, this afternoon. Uh, in your opening statement, uh, you mentioned some statistics also want to cite some troubling statistics that have been provided by uh, the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, physical year 2021, uh, CBP encountered a record number of immigrants along the southwest border, 1.73 million. Physical year 2022, we are on track to surpass that number. Uh, in the first five months, we have encountered 838,000 immigrants, uh, and current estimates are that we encountered over 200,000 immigrants in March of 2022, bringing during the first six months of physical year 2022, bringing that number to over 1 million immigrants encountered across that southwest border. Uh, we've seen reports recently that DHS, after the expiration of Title 42, is preparing for the potential increase of as many as 18,000 immigrant encounters every day some two and a half to three times higher than the number of encounters that we are currently facing. We know that Title 42 has been successful. We saw it implemented under the administration of President Donald Trump. Under the original administration, uh, over 90% of immigrants were, retired, were returned to their country of origin, origin under Title 42. Uh, we've seen under the Biden administration, we've seen that number drop. Uh, but it is still above 50. 55 percent of immigrants that are encountered today by the Department of Homeland Security are returned to their country of origin under Title 42. Uh, we know that in outdoor circumstances that the use of Title 42, that an immigrant can be processed within as little as 15 minutes. Uh, and so now here, as we are within just six weeks, a little over six weeks of Title, title 42 coming to an end on May the 23rd, uh, Sheriff, I want to ask you, as a 38-year law enforcement officer, someone who has dedicated uh, your entire career to protecting your community at the southwest border, uh, your continued daily interaction with Border Patrol, uh, with the Department of Homeland Security, uh, my question to you is, are we prepared to deal with the surge of immigrants that the Department of Homeland Security is predicting? Can we, can we in any shape, form, or fashion, process anywhere close to 18,000 immigrants coming across our border every day. And 18,000 immigrants in over a 30-day period is over 500,000 immigrants in an individual month. And so are we prepared to deal with that surge of immigrants coming across the border? Madam Immigrants, I will say this. No, we are not. Uh, what we're not talking about when it comes to our southern border is the rule of law. We're also not talking about border security. We are turning this into two separate programs. We have immigration, we have border security. And sadly, border security has been set aside, the absent words within our border. So talking to my fellow agents, talking to the federal leadership with Border Patrol, uh, working with our communities, we are outpaced here on the southern border right now. We run details right now every day, costing my county $17,000 a week, just trying to help Border Patrol and keep our communities safe. Uh, from the fair to yields, 
uh, the juvenile smugglers, the adult smugglers, the repetitive crime, home evasions, murder, you name it, we're seeing it down here. And we're we're not exempt. This has happened all along our southern border. Right now, we need to get a handle on the rule of law, support our borders, support our men and women wearing the badge, and address immigration. Uh, we're, we're missing the rule of law here and border security. And Sheriff, during your opening statement, you also gave some individual examples about cases where we had seen immigration, uh, illegal immigrants come across the border uh, and the impact that it had had uh, on your citizens directly. And so my question is, with Title 42 setting to expire, uh, with the number of immigrants we believe that will dramatically increase, uh, two things. One, what impact will this have on your community personally? Uh, and then what impact will this have on both human trafficking uh, and uh, drug smuggling? Well, I, Member Gress, the first thing I would say is this, that we need to understand smuggling comes with criminal cartels. These transnational organizations, they have no respect for Americans, have no respect for communities that we're talking about today. And it's going to be a huge impact. We're already outpaced, like I said a few minutes ago. We're already overwhelmed in these rural communities. There's 31 uh, counties along the southwest border, 20 are considered rural like mine. We don't have the resources. All I hear is uh, we're talking about CDC. Folks, I'll just say the last 18 months, I don't recall Dr. Fauci or anybody from CDC talking about our southern border and what law enforcement's been addressing when it comes to the health pandemic down here. Uh, I would argue that all day. Nobody has talked to us, and that's a big concern to share us. We have tried to reach out to this administration to include, to include letters uh, to the President of the United States, and it's gone on deaf ears, it's intellectual avoidance. So if I say I'm frustrated, if I say my fellow sheriffs are frustrated, that'd be an understatement. So we are concerned because there's not a collective action, there's not a collective shared plan, and there's not a collective message, especially starting communities with this administration. The gentleman's time has expired. Um, I also want to point out that there's not a prediction that there's going to be 18,000 migrants a day. The um, committee, rather the uh, department, is preparing, preparing for different scenarios. Um, with that, I will yield to Mr. Green, the gentleman from Texas, for your five minutes. Mr. Green, I think you're still on mute. We still can't hear you, Mr. Green. Okay, there he goes. Thank you. I'm audible. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, to the law enforcement officer who is there, I would have you know I have great respect for law enforcement. Thank you. Uh, my uncle was a deputy sheriff, and uh, I believe that I'm in Congress probably because of him. Uh, he told me when I was a very young child that I was going to be a lawyer. And because he was so well respected from that moment forward, I wanted to be a lawyer. I never had any thought of being anything else. By the way, I didn't know what a lawyer was at the time, but my uncle said it and it meant something. So I have great respect. Thank you. I, this, this problem at the border is something that we've been grappling with for some time. It seems to me that any solution is going to require doing something about the conditions that would cause a mother, knowing what can happen to her child along this route, cause that mother to say, I'm going to risk sending my child north because the conditions here are such that I don't believe my child is safe. So it seems to me that we have to focus on doing something about those conditions. Uh, I believe that the, the, the law enforcement officers, I, I don't doubt you when you say you're overwhelmed, but what you're doing is at the border and we have to do something beyond the border. Um, we now have sent billions to Ukraine and I voted to do it and I'll send more. I wanna send planes. I wanna do whatever we can do to help them. It seems to me that we can do something more for our neighbors. And I think it's going to take the will of Congress to get it done. But uh, that that has to be a part of the solution. Now, I've had a personal experience with this. I had a constituent, Mr. Escobar, who was deported. Uh, he was married to an American woman. He had two children born in the United States of America, no criminal history, and he was deported. 
I went to El Salvador three times. I brought him home on the third time. Three times. He could not walk the streets. He, when he was deported, he became sort of a target, if you will. So we brought him home. He was, he was within the law, nothing outside of the law. But it's, it's really sad to know the conditions that persons are living under such that they would send their children over this long distance. And the staff has provided me some intelligence that I'd just like to share with uh, everyone. I'm sure that everyone has perused the documentation that we have. It reads, families and other asylum seekers expelled back to Mexico are often targeted by drug cartels and face violence and extortion. In fact, human rights organizations have documented nearly 10,000 instances of people being kidnapped, tortured, sexually assaulted, and murdered after being expelled under Title 42. Title 42 is the law of the land. I'm not debating whether that should not happen under the law of the land, just stating the facts. Conditions in Mexico have led to hundreds of parents fearing for the lives of their children to choose to sell, self-separate, send their children across the border alone, knowing that unaccompanied children would be accepted and cared for by the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, it's, it's a tragedy. So Sheriff, I'm, I'm appealing to you. I just want to know, do you know enough about it? If you don't, I understand. To, to give a comment about the conditions that are, are causing a mother to send her baby on this dangerous journey knowing what the consequences might be, but she'd rather face that than have her child stay with her and suffer. Your thoughts, Chair, please. Member Green, I appreciate those comments. And one of my objectives as a sheriff and with my sheriff association is humanitarian. We, we have big hearts here as we wear the badge and we respect. I've talked to my sheriffs in Del Rio, Sheriff Martinez, Sheriff Wilmot over in Yuma, Arizona. They, they see what you're talking about. That's what you're, those examples. In my section of the Southeast corner of the state of Arizona, we don't see that. We see 100% aggravated individuals that are camouflaged and are coming to the country for all ill intent. They're taking advantage of current times. Um, that's what bothers me. That's why I'm testifying today on the public safety side of this and the humanitarian side. We also see the death. We also see those that die in the process of coming across our border because we've lost the management side of it on the public safety side. And that's where I come from. There's got to be a balance. Member Green, I agree with you. There's got to be a balance. We need to take the politics out of this. We need to take the re-election thoughts out of it. Let's get to the business and secure our country, secure our border, and make this humanitarian and public safety and national security. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Sheriff, Mayor. thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I will now yield to the gentleman from, from, the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Clyde, for your five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman and uh, Ranking Member, for holding this hearing today. Um, for our three witnesses who are here in committee room, um, and we'll start with uh, Dr. Richards here. Please answer yes or no to this question. Do you think border security directly relates to national security? Yes or no? I don't see how that has anything to do with public health or medical science. Okay, you're a... You're a doctor, sir. You've got an MD, a PhD, you're a smart guy. So you don't have an opinion? Yes or no? The, the two are related, yes. Okay, all right, we'll go to the next person. What do you think, sir? Does border security directly relate to national security? That is certainly an issue that certain members of this house have tried to make uh, a connection. So between. yes or no? Receiving asylum seekers is uh, right, not yes a or no, sir. security issue. Y yes or no? You don't have an opinion. It, you, it sir. It can, but it depends on the context. So it could. I, again, it depends on the context of what we're talking about. Okay, all right. 
Um, <clears throat> do you think we have a secure border? I mean, you, you've seen the news. Do you, have, do you think we have a secure border? By almost every metric, the border is in some ways more secure than it has been. Um, according to Customs and Border okay. Protection. Okay, all right, itself, thank you. All right, we'll go, the, go back to you. Returning asylum seekers to be kidnapped, raped, tortured in Mexico is not a secure border. Okay, we do not have a secure border. Um, and you, doctor, do you think we have a secure border? From the perspective of human rights, uh, human rights law, the treaties that the U.S. has ratified and the 1980 Just yes or no Act, is fine, sir. Then the answer is no. Those, it is not secure. We do not have those a secure rights border. Are being violated. Thank you. You know, we have a rule of law. And this country is literally the most prosperous and the most free in the world because we have a rule of law, because we believe that everyone should follow the law, and we have immigration law. Um, Sheriff, what do you think? Do you think border security directly relates to national security? Absolutely, 100% correct on that. And, and I, if I could add, member, um, the fact that we have lost law enforcement on the southern border as a result of an unsecure border, both on the health side of it and the public safety because of the violent acts. My office right now is investigating several uh, acts here in the last few weeks, that uh, last month, where an agent was, they tried to cut his throat, had another one, they tried to kill the agent. So, yes, the secure border is national security and community public safety. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, just to follow up, um, as of right now, how much of your manpower goes into filling the gaps for the federal government as it relates to the flow of illegal immigration and smuggling? And if Title 42 goes away, how do you think that will change for you, for your, your agency? Currently, we're spending $17,000 a week out of a rural county sheriff's office to address border security. We have had over 1,000 calls in the last eight to nine months, just border-related crimes, just to my office. We run details every day just to assist Border Patrol that are stretched very thin right now. Uh, this, Like I said, this is the worst I've ever seen when it comes to lack of management on our southern border. So you're spending almost a million dollars or right around a million dollars a year because the federal government is not doing its job when it comes to illegal immigration and smuggling. If Title 42 goes away, how much do you think that's going to change? It, it's going to compound that to levels I've never seen in my uh, four decades almost. The state of Arizona provided my office $12.8 million just to address the cost. In the first five months, my overtime budget, both in jail and patrol, was 92% expended. We don't have the funds. Um, the state of Arizona and the Governor Ducey, that's why I thanked him, have been stepping up just to help us secure our borders here in Southern Arizona. Well, thank you. So it's quite evident that if Title 42 goes away, it's gonna um, be a huge impact on local law enforcement and local communities. In the Biden administration's decision to phase out and ultimately terminate Title 42 will only further exacerbate the crisis at our southern border. As of March 2022, U.S. Border Patrol officers and agents have expelled over 1.7 million illegal immigrants under Title 42 since its inception in March of 2020. During 2021, over 2 million illegal border immigrants were apprehended by Border Patrol, of which more than 400,000 were released into the United States apprehended illegal immigrants that were simply released into the United States. That's unconscionable. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Clark, for your five minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Let me thank our ranking member for uh, today's hearing. Um, let me uh, go directly to my questions. My first question is to Mr. Uh, Kazuka. Um, Title 42, in my humble opinion, is an inhumane policy that has allowed CBP to expel about 1.7 million migrants without granting them access to the asylum system. Your organization has documented nearly 10,000 instances of people being kidnapped, tortured, sexually assaulted, and murdered after being expelled under Title 42. Can you further describe the dangerous conditions that asylum seekers and migrants face upon their expulsion and how it disproportionately affects uh, migrants of African descent? 
Thank you for that question, Representative. Um, it is a sad truth that the Title 42 policy has had a devastating impact uh, leading to grievous human rights violations of people who've been returned or blocked in Mexico, unable to seek asylum. We don't even know how many of the 1.7 million times Title 42 has been used were on people trying to seek asylum because there are no screenings, because the department is not following US law to determine who is an asylum seeker, who is in need of protection, who should be permitted to continue the asylum process. For people who are trapped in Mexico, who are sent back to Mexico, they face daily violence. They're at risk of being kidnapped, of being tortured, of being extorted by the cartels that there's been so much concern about on this committee. Um, and those are businesses of the cartels that have expanded because of Title 42, not in spite of Title 42. They're not being uh, depleted by Title 42. They are a boon to, title, to the cartels. They give the cartels an opportunity to target people who are trapped in Mexico. And these policies have had a disproportionate impact on people of African descent because they face anti-black discrimination and violence throughout Mexico. As I mentioned in my remarks, um, we have documented many cases of people of African descent who've been attacked, including by Mexican authorities, police, migration, uh, military, who were either directly responsible for those attacks or complicit in them. And African uh, descendant migrants also face discrimination. They have great difficulty finding a way to support themselves, to find a place to live while they're waiting to seek asylum in the United States. And many, uh, even today, are waiting near ports of entry, hoping that the United States will comply once again with our US asylum laws and permit them the opportunity to seek protection at a port of entry. Very well, I thank you for your response. Um, to Mr. Richland Melnick and Dr. Richards, the United States response to the Ukrainian asylum seekers and refugees has illustrated that we are capable of processing migrants when we want to. Uh, what recommendations would you have so that the federal government can best use its resources to process migrants waiting to claim asylum? Thank you, uh, Representative Clark. We have recommended a resource surge to the ports of entry so that CBP can better process migrants arriving at the ports of entry and in prevent the kind of buildup that we're seeing occurring right now. For the last four years, access to asylum at the ports of entry has been heavily restricted, first through metering, which the Trump administration put in place in 2018, and then through the near complete shutdown in 2020 due to Title 42. If we had spent the last four years pouring money into the ports of entry and finding a way to process asylum seekers safely and humanely and orderly, far fewer people would feel the need to cross between the ports of entry. We can do this. Congress just funded the ports and Border Patrol and CBP to uh, respond to migration, and a lot of that money and resources should go to the ports of entry. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Richards? Sure, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, Congresswoman, well, the CDC has recognized that we need to be flexible in both time and place and how we respond and that that should be driven by science. So as the coronavirus you know, shifts in its intensity and its severity, how lethal it is, our response is gonna vary. And we have more tools now, that's the good news, than we ever have before with treatments, certainly vaccines, but as I mentioned in my comments, it's the usual public health tools of masking, social distancing, making sure you limit the number of people in detention and the time spent in congregate settings. Thanks. Very well, thank you. Madam Chair, I yield back and I thank you for uh, this hearing. It's very important that we uh, put Th the truth uh, up front. Thank you. Thank you. I'll the yield gentlewoman back. yields back. Um, now the chair will recognize um, Representative Escobar, the gentlewoman from Texas, for her five minutes. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I really appreciate the opportunity to wave on to the committee today, and thank you for hosting this very important hearing. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists for being here. I serve in Congress representing the U.S.-Mexico border community of El Paso, Texas. I am a lifelong El Paso and a third-generation proud border resident. 
Um, and I am so proud to uplift the voice of my community, which has always engaged with migrants in the spirit of goodwill, welcoming the stranger, um, really embracing true American values. You know, our Republican colleagues can't have it both ways. Um, just uh, a week ago, weeks ago, uh, they decried President Bri Biden uh, as not um, uh, doing anything on the border. And then when he lifts Title 42, claiming what he was doing was working, so let's keep doing what he was doing. The fact of the matter is migration patterns have been changing, and we, we started seeing that change 10 years ago, um, not during the Biden administration, not during the Trump administration, but before that. And Congress and administration after administration really has failed to act. I'm proud to be part of House Democrats who brought forward comprehensive uh, immigration reform, but we get stymied at every turn by Republicans who choose to obstruct instead of work towards solutions. The truth is, this is complicated. It's not easy. There's no one more who wants to see security and dignity than those of us who live on the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, but, but addressing migration at the border and only at the border really is a signal of failure. And I wish we could all recognize that failure and the opportunity. We have had a test case during the entirety of the Trump administration and one year into the Biden administration. Do walls stop migration? Does Title 42 stop migration? We've tried that. And for colleagues of mine who want to stop migration, I hope that the test case um, has proven up what works and what doesn't work. Um, Mr. Reichlin Melnick, I have a series of questions for you. I'm gonna try to get through as many of them, so if we can be succinct. Um, First, you know, my colleagues talk about the number of encounters at the border, and the media, CBP, have reported these numbers. Um, those numbers, do they, are they representative of individuals arriving at the border? Or what, what do encounters mean, if you, succinctly, if you could tell yeah. us? An encounter is an arrest or, of an individual take by Customs and Border Protection. So importantly, the same person can be arrested multiple times. In my opening statement, I talked about one person arrested 30 times and expelled every time under Title 42. That was 30 encounters. We actually know it hasn't been 2.5 million people over the last, since the start of fiscal year 21. Despite 2.5 million encounters, there's been 820,000 repeat encounters. So it's actually about 1.7 million. And in addition, border crossings are actually lower than they were 20 years ago because- And I'm gonna interrupt you. That takes me to my next yeah. question. So the sheriff mentioned this is the worst he's ever seen. Um, and again, mind you, with walls, and with Title 42, it's the, quote, worst he's ever seen. How do the numbers of encounters, you were about to get into that, what we've seen in the last uh, year, how does that compare over time? Yeah, so uh, 20 years ago, people weren't coming through Cochise County. They were coming through the Tucson sector, I mean, which is also included in that, but they were coming a little bit further over west and primarily in California as well. But also, we had far fewer Border Patrol agents and far less surveillance at the border. So in fiscal year 2000, when there were 1.7 million encounters, CBP and DHS estimates that there were an additional 2 million undetected unlawful entries. That's and not very, the case today. Perfect, thank you. Very quickly, when members say people need to get in line or do it the right way, yes or no, has Congress created a line or a right way? For almost every migrant who comes to the border, the right way is to cross the border and seek asylum because seeking asylum is legal. There is no other pathway. When was the last time Congress updated uh, immigration law? 1996, um, but that was basically the last time. So it's been almost 25 years. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to just talk a little bit about my remaining few seconds, securing the border and the question around whether the border has uh, been secured. For over a decade, Republicans have told uh, Democrats, if you will just secure the border, we'll give you comprehensive immigration reform. Hundreds of millions of dollars later into border security, there's been no movement on comprehensive immigration reform. Um, and the more that we shrink legal avenues, which is what's happened, the more that we should anticipate that we will see more irregular crossings. So I, I invite Congress to work on real solutions. Uh, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. I want to thank our panelists. I want to thank um, all the members for questions.
Um, I think this is a very important hearing. Um, I think it's timely. Um, Title 42, as I mentioned, um, is a tool of the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. Um, and it was used as a public health uh, declaration. Um, there's been a lot of talk about the rule of law, and frankly, the rule of law is that you can come to a port and you can apply for asylum, and we're not following that rule of law. And so there is one agreement where we have, where the rule of law is not being followed. Um, our frustration on our side is that because the rule of law is not being followed, immigrants can't come to a port of entry and seek asylum, which is legal in the United States. So that's been my frustration as I kind of hear, and then we talked about border security. Um, as we all know, as members of Homeland Security, we've been to multiple briefings, and we know the largest terror threat is from not the southern border. It's the northern border. So this is where I think, and, and maybe, maybe we, we need to have a conversation about that, but this is why I think it's helpful for us to have the hearing, and I appreciate the participation on both sides today. And again, to all our witnesses, um, I want to thank you all for your um, valuable testimony. And you, Sheriff, um, thanks for joining us virtually as well. Uh, without objection, I submit statements for the record from Kids in Need of Defense, First Focus on Children, the Latin American Working Group, the Friends Committee on National Legislation, and the Young Center for Immigrant Children's Rights. The members of the subcommittee may have additional questions for the witnesses, and we ask that you respond expeditiously in writing. The chair reminds members that the committee record remains open for 10 business days, and without objection, the, sub the subcommittee stands adjourned.